So let's talk about epistemology one more time. And as far as I can ascertain, as I pointed out in videos in the past, I do not think we as a society or we as a culture are dealing with epistemology in all of its fullness. We're not handling the subject correctly as of yet. There's definitely a science to epistemology, but it, uh, once again, it is science in its infancy. So let's examine how do we come to know the things we know? Now, as far as I can tell, there are at least three legs of epistemology. There may be more, but I can only think of three. There's propositional knowledge. 99 times out of 100, when an atheist says, prove it, provide your evidence, they are talking only in the realm of propositional knowledge, because that's the only time where empirical evidence is relevant or at least the most important time, maybe not the only time. So, what do I mean? You say, X is true, and then someone goes, prove it. So you provide your evidence. Here's proposition X. Okay, how do we, know, how do we verify that proposition X is true? Well, here's a piece of evidence A, piece of evidence B, piece of evidence C. Ah, proposition X is true. Now, when I have talked about my own personal Christian faith, I'm talking about experiential knowledge. That's a very different thing than propositional knowledge. That's the second leg of epistemology. Now, however wildly implausible experiential knowledge is theoretically, if I experience it directly, I know it. Now, you don't necessarily believe me if you're an atheist. But I just want you to think clearly without debating. Okay? Let's think of something wildly implausible. Let's say I live right next to the Malibu Beach Inn. There's a parking lot. There's an elephant in the parking lot next to the Malibu Beach Inn right down the street. I say to you, that's really not plausible. That's not plausible. Whether it's plausible or not, let's say for argument's sake it's actually true for some mysterious reason there was a circus in town and they couldn't park the elephant near the circus grounds and the only place that they could put it was was the so it's implausible but let's just say for argument's sake that it's completely true we're we're having this debate in my my apartment of what relevance is any evidence i there's nothing i can say in the conversation here is, here is Proposition X about an elephant. It's completely implausible that there would be an elephant in the parking lot. But yet I go down the street and sure enough, why, this is my elephant imitation. That's my elephant imitation. You don't like it? I thought it was pretty good. Well, okay, it's not that great, but I can promise you it is the best elephant. I can literally promise you for a fact that is the best elephant imitation you will hear on YouTube today. So you don't think it's all that great? Fine. I say it's the best one you will hear on YouTube probably this entire week. So there. I think it's a pretty good elephant imitation if I say so myself. So remember, for argument's sake, there's actually an elephant in the parking lot. I walk down the street, I see the elephant. What on earth is an elephant doing in the parking lot? I see it with my own eyes. I experience it directly. I come back to my apartment. What, what do I care about propositional uh, uh, knowledge about how likely the, rel the elephant is to be there? I don't care. One iota of a fig. Why? I saw it directly with my own eyes. Now, I get most of you atheists don't believe me that I experienced God directly or I experience present tense God directly. I get you don't believe me. I'm just trying to point out we are talking about a different type of knowledge than propositional knowledge. If I see an elephant with my own eyes and I see it's there, however implausible it is that an elephant is in the parking lot across the street, if I see it directly and I have no reason to doubt my senses, yeah, I'd probably do a check on myself. Am I drunk? Am I high? Am I drugged out? Am I, am I insane? And as I pointed out in the other videos, I go to my wife. Am I crazy? And she goes, yeah, yeah, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I've been telling you that for years. Now I take my wife and she sees the elephant too. So now we have outside confirmation. There's an elephant there. Sure enough, there'd be a logical explanation. Okay, sure enough, there would be a logical explanation. Like I said, however implausible the reality may be, you have to deal with the reality. But all I'm talking about is for the epistemology. 
If I saw the elephant, experienced it directly, I took my wife to see it, she experienced it directly, we wouldn't need, we wouldn't come back and be, nothing else would change our mind. We saw it with our own eyes. The propositional knowledge about the likelihood of an elephant being in a parking lot or the evidence, the evidence that we'd be discussing apart from the direct experience would be completely irrelevant to me. It's why I don't deal with most of this stuff on, on most of the stuff that Christian apologists and atheists get into debates about. Honestly, it's a lot of why I don't, don't deal with any of it. Why? There's no relevance to me whatsoever. None. None. Now, if in, let's take the analogy back down to Christianity. If you're an atheist and you wanted to actually, you, you, first of all, you'd have to believe me that I have some sort of experience with the Holy Spirit that's real to me and could be real to you. But you would have to try to experience it directly for yourself. We couldn't, we couldn't sit in my apartment and debate about an elephant. I would say, get up and go look down the street. Go look for yourself. You understand? The debate we would have about the reality of the elephant would be completely and utterly irrelevant. I'd say, go look for yourself. There's an elephant there. And then you'd get up and walk down the street, and then you'd be convinced. Oh, my God, there really is an elephant there. However implausible it may seem. So the plausibility or implausibility of the fact is basically irrelevant. The question is, is the fact true? Now, one way of ascertaining whether a fact is true is propositional knowledge. But that doesn't give you any information when it comes to experiencing something. Propositional knowledge and experiential knowledge are completely different types of epistemology. Now let's take the third and arguably the most important. So it's called sociology of epistemology. I honestly think that that's probably the most important in establishing religious beliefs. Sociology of epistemology has to do with, you know, what group do I identify with? When I was 13, those are the cool kids. I wanted to be the cool kid. Yo, what's up, guys? What's going down? Whatever the cool kids told me was so, was so. Why? Because I, I identified with that group. I want to be one of them. I wanted to get the good, the cool girl, the, the, the good-looking girls. Yo, what's up, guys? What's going on? Ew, it's Craig. What a, get out of here, Craig. What a loser. <laughs> no, it didn't go down like that. I ran the show. I was like, yo, what's up, guys? All right, fall in line. No, didn't go like down like that either. Okay, anyways. Sociology of epistemology is a lot more important as far as I'm concerned. Who is giving you the information? Do you identify with the group of people giving you the information? Do you want to join their club? I think this has a lot more to do with what's happened to Christianity in the last 30 years. Honest to God. Honest to God. Because it depends, what you believe is who's telling you there's no evidence for Christianity. Someone says there's no evidence for Christianity. Who's telling you that? Do you identify with them? Or do you still want to be in the club of Christianity? See, Christian reputation has taken a huge PR hit over the last 30 years. 30 some odd years. In the public eye. That's just the reality of the country we live in today. Once upon a time, you're talking circa 1955, you told somebody they were Christian and that would automatically put, put, go, oh, he's probably got all these qualities and those qualities they would ascribe to you would be good, positive. Oh, he's probably really kind, like Bing Crosby. He probably helps out orphans. He's probably a really nice guy who cares about the world. He's honest. Nowadays, the associations are almost routinely negative. That's kind of the fault of the church, honest to God. There's, there's a PR war that goes on in all organizations. And, you know, ask the atheists. You, you see how they, what they say. I see this a lot. Godless Mom, for example, said, my goal is to normalize atheism, make everybody think that atheism is A-OK. -okay. Um, I've seen Shannon Q say very similar things. They kind of understand that part of their goal is winning a PR war some mysterious war for, like, you know, reputation. And the Christian reputation in the popular imagination since, like, 1962 on has done nothing but go down. You go to 1955, 
It was almost routinely, the, the popular imagination, if you said I was a Christian, it was almost routinely positive associations. Like I said, the thought of you as Bing Crosby. Oh, he probably helps out orphans and sings nice Christmas songs. <laughs> He's probably a really nice guy. Nowadays, they think you're automatically. Oh, you're a Christian? Do you like gay? Automatically think you're, you know, homophobic, anti-science, and dogmatic and ideological. Automatically. Those associations pop up. And people don't want to be in our club. Honestly, that has a lot to do with it. I've interviewed a lot of atheists on their deconversion theory, and I've listened to a hundred more on YouTube. And a big starting point of what you find propositionally true in terms of the scriptures or how valid or plausible a lot of it is, a big starting point was I don't know if I want to be in this club. I don't know if I like these people. I don't know if I want to be a part of, you know, I don't want to play in their reindeer games necessarily. That's why the, the, part, the, the deconvert usually starts searching the scriptures to begin with. Because let's be perfectly crystal clear, honest. I go to a church today, every, not every Sunday, but mostly, most Sundays, okay? Not a lot of people in the church I go to give one iota of a fig about what Exodus is saying about slavery. Honestly, they don't. You know, atheists will say there's a lot of cognitive dissonance in the Bible. They went and sought that out. It's not cognitive dissonance that's a real-world thing to any, any church attendees. We, the apologists, deal with that stuff because we're trying to, you know, reconcile parts of the scriptures. That's fine. But that's not groundbreakingly important to most of the people in the church today. It's not even, even vaguely relevant. A lot of them don't even know that there are these, you know, mysteriously terrible scriptures that need to be reconciled. There's no cognitive dissonance. Why? They don't care. Like my wife. She's a Christian in good standing. Her faith is really strongly important to her. She doesn't necessarily care about what, what the Old Testament says about X. She just assumes there's some good explanation for it somehow, and that's it. There's no cognitive dissonance at all. Why do the atheists start seeking out those scriptures to begin with? Why did they start digging in a way, in that particular way? Because they didn't really want to be part of the club. They looked around and said, these people aren't what I identify with. This is not how I want to be. And they may have been correct. They may have been correct. You know, there's a certain type of Christian that if you, you know, I can't promise you that Paul Gia, for example, living out his life with the, with the particular group of Christians that he was in, in deep with, that wouldn't have produced a kind of soul death in him. You know, would he ever actually become the fullness of who he was literally designed to be? That's how I believe it, literally designed to be by God. The Christians would have, might have limited it in him. So I'm rambling a bit. I don't know if that makes sense. But I think that's the most important part of the... I don't know if that made complete sense. I'll make, I'll make other videos where I address it more in depth. But I really honestly think... And keep in mind, this particular video is just my first attempt on the subject. I'm just thinking out loud. A lot of my videos are just me thinking out loud. They're not, you know, they're, they're more like notes, ideas. So I'm just thinking out loud on the subject. I honestly think the most important thing, one of the most important legs in epistemology is who's giving you the information? And do you identify with those people? Do you want to be one of those, those type of people? That has a lot to do with how important or relevant the information is going to seem to you. It has everything to do with how relevant the information is. I was 13 years old. I wanted to be with the cool kids. What the cool kids told me was so, was so. Why? It was really relevant to me. Really and 150% relevant because I wanted to be in the club. I wanted to join the club. I really honestly think that's hugely important when it comes to epistemology. Who's giving you the information? Do you identify with them? Do you want to be a part of their group? So, anywho, that's all for now, kids. Uh, yeah, a little rambly, but I think there was some, some really good substance in there. That is all for now. Amen.